Um, so welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we have, um, oh, I'll just go back to this, we have uh, Loving to Survive by Dee Graham, discussed by Laura Lacona and Sheila Jeffries. Um, so welcome Laura and Sheila and over to you. Yes, hello everyone, hello sisters. Lovely to be with you this Sunday morning. Now it's my pleasure today to be talking with Laura Lacona about the book, Loving to Survive. Uh, the, it's called Loving to Survive, Sexual Terror, Men's Violence and Women's Lives, which really gives the, uh, the full understanding of the book because men's terror and sexual terror is crucial to it, as we shall say. It was published in 1994 by Dee Graham and Laura Lacona suggested it as a book for discussion and I'm really pleased she chose it because it's a very important book and it isn't very well known. Now please, as, as we are going through this webinar, can you use the chat to put any questions or comments that you would like to make about the book because I hope we'll have a little time to look at those at the end. Now about Laura. Laura studied philosophy. Um, she's from Mexico. She's been an editor and translator for more than 30 years now and a feminist since she found out how pervasive violence against women is. And the first book by me that she read was The Lesbian Heresy back in 1996, probably because it had been translated into Spanish. Is it, that's probably the reason. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> and she's the country contact for the WHRC in Mexico. Well, I'm going to start off by saying a bit about um, D. Graham. It's going to be a very little because there's not much information available. She was a professor of psychology and the book is really, it is a, a new psychology of women, an understanding of the psychology of women at the University of Cincinnati. And this seems to be her only book. And she wrote it with Edna Rawlings and Roberta Riggs, Rigsby. Now there's very little information online, so I can't really tell you very much. The book is in the Cross Current series with New York University Press. And it's, it's very, very hard now and always was very hard to get radical feminism published, particularly by academic publishers. But New York University Press had a very good record in this respect at the time. For instance, in 1979, it published Kathleen Barry's wonderful book, Female Sexual Slavery. And I will be discussing Kathleen's work later in this series with um, Megan Tyler from Australia. Kathleen Barry ran the Cross Current series, which published excellent and very significant work of radical feminist theory. It also published two books of mine at the time, it did the US imprint of my book, Anticlimax, a couple of years after its launch in the UK in 1990, for instance. So there were radical feminists there. And it's hard to imagine radical feminists being anywhere academic at this time. Now, Laura, can you explain to us why you chose the book and why it's important? And can you say when you read the book, how it fits into your feminist career? and why it was important to you at that time. Sure, Sheila, thank you very much. First of all, I, I'm delighted to be here and speaking with you about this, this book. And uh, thank you to all, all the women in the audience for coming. So uh, I chose this book because I cannot believe it is not as widely known as Susan Brown Miller's Against Our Will, for example. And since I read it, I want to recommend it to all feminists I'm amazed at the rigor of her writing. This is not abstract theorizing. This is not a simple speculation or a happy intuition. Graham systematically, systematically backs each of her suggestions in behavioral studies. And the explanatory capacity of her theory is amazing. That is what I most appreciate about it. It acts almost as a scientific demonstration as to the extent in which sexual stereotypes inform the way society works. Uh, also, I have always wondered, where is she? She seems to have disappeared from the face of the earth. There's not a single photo of her on the internet, for example. And I don't see enough radical feminists citing her each time reality proves her right, which is 
every time a woman stays in a violent relationship and every time a woman is killed by the man she loves. When it comes down to male violence towards women, in my mind, all roads lead to Diraham. I think that is what Diraham says. She predicted it. So that's the reason I chose the book. And how it fits into my feminist career. Well, uh, let me tell you wh why I read it. I read it because my partner and I, who back then lived in different cities, wanted to read a feminist work together. And she was the one in charge of choosing, choosing which, which book. She chose Loving to Survive because she saw it on a collection of feminist books on PDF on the internet, and the title drew her attention. We have to admit it's a great title. At that time, it was important, um, especially because it helped me make sense of my late mother's and my sister's relationships with men and understanding them better. Also a, a, a very close friend of mine, I understood why she acted as she did in, in those abusive relationships with men. And, and when I was reading it, it was mind blowing. It, it was a strong and vivid intellectual experience as if everything was falling into place. It was quite enjoyable, although the reality you portrays is of course, truly terrible. Also, there's something I always struggle to make sense of and Graham's societal, societal, societal Stockholm syndrome might account for it. Liberal feminism, and more recently, women who call them, themselves gender critical or even radical feminists, and who some, for some reason use the preferred pronouns with some men who claim to have a female gender identity and happen to be their friends. Those seemingly irrational behaviors, because I, I honestly think it is irrational to think men can be women, those seemingly irrational behaviors might be accounted for by the presence of the precursors of Stockholm syndrome, as, as Graham calls them. A, a feminist believing a man can be a woman and supporting trans activism is a woman who is adopting the point of view of, of the oppressor, that is, of men. A woman apologizing for having used the wrong pronouns. A group erasing the word girls or women from its name because it fails to include, it fails to include people of all identities. All these are, are women responding to threats from men. A gender critical feminist preferring men identified as trans who recognize themselves as male over radical feminists is receiving small kindnesses from these men, these gender critical trans women. So, so, so as, as I told you, every road <laughs> leads to the, the Graham. I, I think it's, uh, and, and maybe I will sometimes write down this idea, you know, how, how the, this thing we are seeing today with trans activism could be explained by Graham's uh, societal Stockholm syndrome theory. Yes, I think if the theory was better known and better understood, we could use it to explain things like that. But unfortunately, not, it isn't very well known right now. No. Um, but, but thanks for that. Um, I read the book uh, as soon as it came out in 1994, at uh, which point I was in Australia. And at that time, the energy of the women's liberation movement had mostly gone. Um, though the preface to the book suggests otherwise, and that's surprising. The first sentence of the preface is saying, you know, it's a very strong movement getting stronger now. I really don't think that was the case in 1994. Um, and I think it's because it was published that late in 1994, that's one of the reasons why it did not become well known, because the energy had already gone um, from the movement. Um, but for me, and I'll say a bit more about this later on, it was the, the culmination of a lot of work on politicizing and theorizing heterosexuality. And it was in that tradition, which was coming to a head really in the very early 1990s. Now, uh, Laura, uh, would be good if you can give an overview of the shape of the book, because many women have not read it. Uh, sure. Tell us what it was about. Okay, sure. Um, Dee Graham uh, is a psychologist and a radical feminist. Dee Graham, the, the main author of this book, 
for this book, which, as you already told us, Sheila, which is her, her only one, she drew inspiration from feminist social critics and theorists as Kathleen Barry, Susan Brown Miller, Andrea Dworkin, Catherine McKinnon, Jan Baker Miller, and Adrian Rich. And much of her scientific evidence is taken from papers published, published in reviews such as Journal of Interpersonal Violence, Journal of Experimental Social Psychology, Psychology of Women Quarterly, Journal of Research in Personality, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. So it's a radical feminist analysis informed by hardcore psychology, an interesting combination, but not very common to my knowledge. D. Graham had a brilliant insight, and this book is devoted to testing it and backing it, backing it up with loads of evidence. The insight is women in patriarchy, most clearly women who suffer male violence, but also women in general, act towards men as hostages with Stockholm syndrome act towards the, their captors. She herself put to test the validity of her theory with battered women, with women in abusive relationships, in, with abusive dating partners, in young women's dating relationships, and the book has five chapters. The first one called titled Love Thy Enemy, Hostages and Classic so Stockholm Syndrome, where she remembers the story of the widely known case which gave name to this syndrome, where four persons were taken hostage in a bank in Stockholm and were held for six days by two ex-convicts who threatened their lives, but also showed them kindnesses. And they formed a puzzling emotional bond with them. Graham, Graham states that bonding to an abuser is instinctive and plays a survival function for hostages who are victims of chronic interpersonal abuses, and that a victim Stockholm syndrome can be generalized to those who are not a person's captors or abusers. And uh, the, sec the second chapter, Graham's Stockholm syndrome theory, a universal theory of chronic interpersonal abuse with the question mark at the end. Uh, here, Graham proposes that there are four conditions necessary to the development of, of the syndrome. Perceived threat to survival and the belief that one's captor is willing to carry out that threat. The captive's perception of some small kindnesses from the capture within a context of terror. Isolation, this is very important, isolation from perspectives other than those of the captor and perceived inability to escape. These, Graham says, exist in a continuum and are present in, or absent in degrees. And some unique aspects of Graham's Stockholm syndrome theory stated in this chapter are that uh, this theory views bonding to an abuser or a captor as a survival strategy. It asks whether bonding to an abuser or captor is so pervasive as to occur in any interpersonal relationship characterized by inequality and kindness, and thus whether the concept describes oppressor, oppressed group relations in general. Uh, chapter three, here's my weapon, here's my gun, once for pleasure, once for fun, conditions conducive to women's development of societal Stockholm syndrome. Four, Engendered terror, the psychodynamics of Stockholm syndrome applied to women as a group in our relations with men as a group. Five, the beauties and the beasts, women's femininity, love of men and heterosexuality. In these three chapters, three to five, Graham demonstrates how her generalized Stockholm syndrome theory explains the responses of oppressed group members to their oppressors, to their oppressors and specifically women's bonding to men. She also shows how women as a group develop femininity, love for men and heterosexuality as part of a hostage psychology. And finally, chapter six, moving from surviving to thriving, breaking out of societal Stockholm syndrome. And this is a beautiful chapter. Graham reviews feminist science fiction to emphasize the importance of the imagination in order to imagine a world without patriarchy and uh, for women to find a perspective outside our violent culture that will allow us to transform it. Graham says, through our imaginations, 
we can create that other world which we are longing for. And maybe I can, I can quote uh, the, um, a part of the introduction where she says about the book. We regard the effects of, we, the authors, we regard the effects of men's violence against women as crucial in understanding women's current psychology. Men's violence creates ever present and therefore often unrecognized terror in women. For instance, this terror is experienced as a fear by any woman of rape by any man or as a fear of making a man, any man angry. We propose that women's current psychology is actually a psychology of women under conditions of captivity, that is, under conditions of terror caused by male violence against women. Uh, we also propose that no one has any idea what women's psychology under conditions of safety and freedom would be like. We propose that a psychology of women under conditions of captivity is no more natural or intrinsic to women in a genetic or biological sense than a psychology of wild animals in captivity is natural for them. We set forth the idea that women's responses to men and to male violence resemble hostages' responses to captors. More specifically, we propose that a construct recognized in hostage-taking events known as Stockholm Syndrome, wherein hostages and captors mutually bond to one another, can help us understand female psychology and male-female relations. We propose that women's bonding to men, as well as women's femininity and heterosexuality, are paradoxical responses to men's violence against women like captors who need to kill or at least wound a few hostages in order to get what they want. Men terrorize women in order to get what they want. Women's continued sexual, emotional, domestic, and reproductive services. Like hostages who work to placate their captors, lest those captors kill them, women work to please men. And, and, from this, respo and this response brings women's femininity. Femininity describes a set of behaviors that, of behaviors that please men because they, com they communicate a woman's acceptance of her subordinate status. Thus, feminine behaviors are survival strategies. Like hostages who bond to their captors, women bond to men in an effort to survive. And this is the source of women's strong need for connection with men and of women's love of men. So this is, this is a a resume of, 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 her, of her theory. Graham knew quite well that her theory, which re she refers to as societal Stockholm syndrome theory, would be difficult to accept because it had the potential of altering significantly our, wor our worldview. The absolute theory of her theory, the absolute beauty of her theory, sorry, is that it explains a lot of otherwise inexplicable conducts. Or unexplainable conducts. And um, well, this is the overview. Thank, thanks very much, Laura. I mean, as you were speaking, when you were talking about the hostage captor situation, what came into my mind, because I immediately thought marriage, uh, what came into my mind was um, a documentary that I used to show to students, which was about um, Ethiopia child marriage, where the children were the little girl, it, there was a particular case where a little girl, was, she was put on the horse, there was had a veil over her face and she was taken to the man who was 19 years old. And he was terribly, terribly cheerful because he was getting to stick his willy into this um, young woman. Uh, she was huddled in a corner with something over her face, so terrified she could not speak. And it's absolutely classic hostage captor situation. And of course that is true, a forced arranged marriage, child marriage all over the world. But it's not usually seen as so true of marriage in countries like um, you know, Australia and, and Britain and so on. But I think we can probably see from what tends to happen in so many of those marriages, which is actual violence or psychological intimidation and so on, that they are not a world away. I mean, there are some similarities between that little girl and the horse and what can happen in marriage here. And of course, what is likely in the past to have happened much more often. So that's all I was thinking in response, but I mean, it's, it was, it's a powerful image, I think, this, the, the hostage captor situation. Now, um, 
I think well, I'll ask you first what you thought were the most important and useful messages from the book, and then I'll uh, suggest some of my own. Okay. Um, oh, uh, something is happening with the with the sound. Uh, sorry. Well, um, uh, the extent to which every female in this planet is somehow wired by patriarchal violence that that is that is uh, one important message. You you have just uh, given a, a, a very a terrible example of how how we are terrorized by men, but there are other um, uh, more daily examples. As why does a woman in the street, uh, when a when a man tells her to smile, for example, why don't you smile? They say no, this men to women, and women smile. This response is a response, response to terror. They don't want to, to, to make that man angry. And so they smile, even though they don't want to. They, in these little, little actions in everyday life, in, in Western societies that we think that uh, not so, not so um, uh, determined by male violence, for example, as Ethiopia and the, these examples you said, this happens as well. So that's another, another message. It, it, as I told you, it, 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 it's, its explanatory power is, is amazing. And it can explain this, this, this child marriage in Ethiopia, and it can explain the, 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 the behavior of a woman in public transport when, she, when she's leaning, dealing with a man. No? Uh, and, also, an important message is women who stay in abusive relationships are not irrational. The, those behaviors have a perfectly rational uh, explanation. And also uh, that a lot of seemingly unexplainable conducts of women towards men have a psychological explanation and our psychology is rooted in patriarchy. Uh, it, it is very impressive to me, the, this thing I, I, I quoted from the introduction, that, that women, we cannot know how women's psychology in conditions of freedom would be any more as we can know uh, how, how a wild animal can behave if we, if we study it in a, in a zoo, for example. We cannot know that. Uh, and until patriarchy is... Uh, is gone and, and um, overcome, we won't know how women's psychology uh, under conditions of freedom would be. That's a, power mes uh, a powerful message, um, according to me. Yes, thanks very much, Laura. Uh, I'll just answer one question in the chat, if I may, um, before I um, move on. Which is to uh, which is uh, somebody is saying surely the problem is uh, the Stockholm syndrome is sim similar to the concept which is now common amongst feminists of trauma bonding. I have never liked the trauma bonding term. It is very psychological, and it's um, and I think the difference between societal Stockholm syndrome that. Graham is talking about is that it suggests that there must be immediate trauma um, that causes a woman to have trauma bonding. Something's actually happened to her, some obvious violence has happened to her. Whereas, as, as I understand it, D. Graham's theory is very, very much wider than that. She's talking about societal Stockholm syndrome, trying to explain femininity in women and heterosexuality in women. So, this is much, much bigger than so-called trauma bonding. It's about why any woman that you see in the streets is wearing high-heeled shoes or has her head down or whatever. So we're trying to, be, to explain here the behavior of a whole class rather than a woman who's had a particular experience or is in a particular relationship. Um, but what I'll um, try to do now is um, uh, talk, sorry, um, I'm wanting to um, share my screen. I'll try again. Um, there we are. 
Okay, so I just want to show a few of the things that D. Graham said and um, explain why I think that they really sum up things that are very, very important in the book. I have used her book in much of my writing. I used to use it in her teaching because I found it invaluable. And the, the first quote really shows why that is the case. It's very short. <laughs> Masculinity and femininity are code words for male domination and female subordination. Now this is absolutely, absolutely fundamental because it's still widely believed that masculinity and femininity are somehow natural or that some bits of masculinity and femininity are somehow natural. Whereas in fact, of course, um, she argues that masculinity is the behavior of power, male domination. Femininity is the behavior of subordination, female subordination. And she says that uh, the, these, the behavior of women's subordination, femininity, um, is it leads to such things as beauty practices, as, as well as uh, behaviors of subordination, such as, I mean, if you think about what is fem um, femininity, femininity is very much about how a woman holds her body and how she can be in the world. So a woman may not take up space. For instance, when you see women sitting around, they will have their legs crossed. Men will have their legs spread. Um, in um, amount of space that you take up is about power. So powerful men have large offices and so on. So men do the behavior of power. They spread, they lounge, they have particular areas of how, the house that are their own um, and so on. So um, masculinity and domination are about power, female subordination, a woman must keep her eyes down, her legs together, her arms by her side, take up little space. All of these things are seen as somehow natural, but they're not natural, of course. Little girls are put into skirts so that they have to show their knickers whether they wish to or not at a very early age, and then they are constantly told to keep their legs together. I mean, these, these things obviously have an impact. Women have to be vulnerable. Men have to be able to get at the knickers, get at the, woman, the girl or the woman under the skirt. Um, so the, the idea that these are behaviors of, you uh, know, a hierarchy is not well understood, which leads to situations such as there's in some parts of the lesbian, lesbian community, there's a validation of lesbian role playing. Well, it's male dominant, female subordinate behavior because there's no other kind of gender that exists apart from this relationship of power. Um, the she, uh, D. Graham talks about how the psychology of women is the psychology of subordinates. And she makes comparisons with, in the book, I think very powerfully, the situation of prisoners, the situation of slaves. And she, what she argues is that the behavior of subordinates in any situation, this is, quite, this is beyond the Stockholm Syndrome analysis, the behavior of subordinates in those situations of powerlessness have considerable similarities which I think really, really helps us to understand femininity and hopefully show us that we don't have to see it as, as um, somehow um, um, natural. Now, one of the things that she says is not natural is that women do beauty practices. And I know there are lots of people who think that it's somehow natural that women want to tit up about the streets, unable to walk properly because they have high heeled shoes on. Of course, there's nothing natural, but subordinates are, yes, shackled. It's difficult for subordinates to move properly. I mean, that's one of the impositions in, in slavery and so on. She says, for members of either group, and she's talking here about battered women and women who choose beauty practices. She says, for members of either group, to believe differently that, that, that these things are simply individual chosen, natural or whatever, we would need to acknowledge the external variables controlling our behavior and would need to acknowledge our terror. Now, this is very, very important uh, because acknowledging terror is difficult. I mean, it, it, my situation at the moment is that I have my book, Penile Imperialism, has had reviews, some of them extremely critical, 
um, from reviewers and I'm being required to change uh, bits of the book so that the publishers will accept it. One of the things that the editor is saying, because some of the reviewers are saying, is there is no such thing as a reign of terror under which women live. I need to change that because it will not be understood. Readers will immediately reject the book if I hyperbolize like that. It's simply not the case that there is a reign of terror. And I've been trying to explain why I need to keep the term reign of terror in there. Uh, interestingly, Dear Graham says that one of the reasons women reject and cannot acknowledge there's such a thing as a reign of terror, or terror indeed, is to survive. It would be too dangerous, too difficult for them to actually recognize what's going on. So that's really interesting. And of course, in the book, um, I, I don't even mention the fact that, that's come out recently in the news, which is that young women going out, men are sticking hypodermic needles into their hands, into their thighs, injecting drugs so that the woman, women cannot control themselves so that the men can have access to them. This is a thing now. It just used to be strength spiking. Now it's having needles put into the body. Now, I think that's kind of reign of terror material, as is, of course, uh, the murders in the street where men, men just kidnap women, abduct them off the street. There have been several of those in the UK in the last year, including Sarah Everard, who was kidnapped by a policeman who raped and murdered her. So the fact that women have to, as they walk down the street at night, have their keys between their fingers, know where there is a lighted window, listen for steps behind them. If they approach their car, they have to look in the back seat to make sure that nobody is in there. Uh, they have to close the curtains very carefully at night in their house so that nobody can see in. And women do all these things. I think probably the vast majority of women do all of these things to try and ensure their safety. And what are they trying to ensure their safety from? I would argue a reign of terror, but we can't really talk about that. So as Dee Graham says, I think um, there is a difficulty in acknowledging our terror, and therefore we can't understand a lot of the behaviors, one of which uh, she says is indeed beauty practices. And if we look at uh, beauty practices for a moment, I have written quite a bit about this, and there's obviously nothing natural about women having to be show large areas of their body in public spaces, to depilate, um, to have long hair. Long hair is particularly common at the moment, incredibly long, you know, down to the breasts in strange uh, swirly bits. You know, that this, is the, this is the fashion. Um, there's nothing natural about it, but all of it is um, behavior, I would argue, of subordinates. And when I wrote Beauty and Misogyny, in which I used a lot of Dee Graham Ice, I did use her quote here, uh, because we were talking, I was talking in the last chapter about how we get over beauty practices, how we get beyond it so that women don't need to do these practices of subordination. She says, there is every reason to believe that if women examine what it is about giving up our femininity that scares us, and why it scares us, we will know whether we need to keep our femininity or give it up. Um, and she does acknowledge, though, that it's hard to give up a survival strategy. This is me speaking here, while the condition of terror still exists. So I think that's um, a really good question. I doubt that there's any women in our audience who do practices of femininity. It's probably quite unlikely. But if there are women who do practices of femininity, I think they should be asked why giving it up scares them. Uh, why they need to keep it, uh, and so on. And that would show us um, what, is, what is going on. Um, okay, I'm coming out uh, of, of that discussion. Now, the, I'll just say a few more words about why I think it's important. For me, it's important because it's a continuation of a powerful critique of heterosexuality. Uh, as a political institution that was developed in the women's liberation movement and it came to a head about this time. There was my book Anticlimax in 1990, there was the collection by Celia Kitzinger called Heterosexuality a Reader, and there was Diane Richardson's collection Theorizing Heterosexuality, all in the early 90s. And then there was nothing. So in other words, the whole critique of heterosexuality that radical feminists have been creating 
came to a crescendo in the early 90s, and this book is a part of that, um, but it was defeated. I think it was a, a very terrifying analysis for the forces of male power. Um, but it's now, that critique's very little known now. And indeed, most feminists now simply probably see heterosexuality as biological, as natural, and as having no politics at all. Um, so that's why I think the book has been so important or is so important. Now, I think another question really is, is this book still relevant? Are there new things that need to be added today? Are any bits of it outmoded? What do you think, Laura? Uh, I do think it's relevant today. Oh. Um, the final chapter, of, of course, and maybe some, some, some others, but the final chapter has some outdated bits. For example, her, her example of courageous women risking their security to give testimony against male perpetrators of violence is Anita Hill. An updated version should perhaps include the Me Too movement, although maybe the changes this movement brought about aren't as dramatic as Ram would have imagined. She imagined this was a very powerful, uh, I mean, um, uh, naming the men who commit violence. She thought, she thought it would bring, bring about a, a lot of change but I don't think it happened with the Me Too movement, which were thousands of women naming their abusers. And, um, but for, for the first chapters, I, I found almost every page relevant and necessary, at least discussing it. As, as some of your own books, Sheila, maybe it is even more relevant now than, with, that, than when it was first published. Um, and there's an interesting quote uh, from Graham. She says, when proponents of patriarchy get mad, we should get interested, not get afraid, for their mm -hmm. anger indicates we've touched a hot bottom or in some, a hot bottom or in some way gotten too close to the truth for their comfort. And maybe that helps explain as well wh why did, did this book wasn't, uh, wasn't well received when it when it came out. Um, so it, it, perhaps I can say now wh wh why why I think this this book uh, wasn't come to be seen as an important rat film classic apart from from what you just said, Sheila. Um, I I know some people criticize the book very harshly but it seems they didn't quite get it. The, the most salient message for them is, women have sex with men in order to not get killed by them. And many women are keen and want to convince us they like sex with men, they like it, as if this could refute Graham's theory, no? But also perhaps they, they never got to the optimistic part, so to say, or to the conclusion of the last chapter, when Graham states the belief that women someday will cease loving men simply in order to survive and instead will thrive with love, love of ourselves, of other women, and of men who choose to join with us in mutually empowering relationships. She, she, she gives some space to heterosexuality, but, but understood as, 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 as something else, something absolutely different from what it is now. Uh, as we know, uh, um, uh, something um, imposed upon us. And another thing which may stand in the way of this being seen as an important radical feminist classic is the freedom fallacy. Nobody likes being told their decisions and choices are not as liberty based and they would as they would want to believe. And Graham tells us as, as many radical feminist analysis or of prostitution, for example, we are not as free as we would like to think ourselves to be. And that's it. 
thanks. Um, and I just respond to one of the things that you were saying uh, earlier, which is um, the the extraordinary anger that that men will show if women uh, behave in ways that are likely to or, or or if there's likely to be a revelation of their power when it gets kind of close to showing what the problem is men will be very angry and i was just thinking about the extraordinary vicious anger of the transgender rights movement against women and feminists at the moment and that uh, fits in very well because of course the the trans uh, transgenderism men's um sexual excitement of women's clothing because the, it is the clothing of uh, subordination, men's sexual masochism, their excitement at doing the behaviors of women's subordination, the clothing of women's subordination, and so on. For, for instance, online, it actually tells men that they need to keep their knees together because subordinates have their knees together. So it's carefully explained how to do the behavior of subordination. Now they're overwhelming us in, you know, in drag, in the media, and with uh, the behavior of these men, and women are saying no, because it shows up very, very, very clearly what femininity is. The fact that it can be adopted by men for sexual excitement by masochists shows what it is. Now that's dangerous. It's dangerous for these male supremacists and they're fighting back with tremendous anger if women point it out, if women say anything about it. It's a fascinating historical moment when femininity is really on screen and it should be really, really clear to women what it is about. Um, and it is becoming really, really, really clear to women who probably never thought about it, what it is about, in fact. Um, I'll just say a little bit about, um, or, or maybe before but I do that, I saw a question in the chat, which maybe I should answer because I might forget it at the end, which is, um, am I doing an updated version of unpacking queer politics? Well, I haven't been asked to, and Polity Press, who published that book back in 2003, were very upset at the time that it did not sell. Nobody was interested. And so it's selling now. I don't know whether suddenly they'll decide there needs to be a new version and ask me to do that. Um, I'm not going to write another whole book. If they ask me to do a new version or if they give me the copyright so I can hand it to friends to publish it, I will do a new introduction, a question about that and a whole new chapter and so on and so on. Um, but yes, in terms of why hasn't this book been seen as, as important now, I think this is a really important questioning question. And why is it so little known? And I do think it's because the critique of heterosexuality is so little known now. So nobody's been noticing this book, although I'm very, very pleased to see that there's gonna be a Portuguese translation and that a German translation is on the way. This is absolutely terrific. Um, I think that it's very radical for this time um, because the whole of the radical feminist analysis about um, the uh, about the politics of the personal is not really known now. It's not discussed now. Um, topics such as beauty practices, for instance, which are really almost never criticized now, uh, even though the wonderful Korean feminists in their anti-corset movement are dropping all of these practices of subordination in a wonderful way. Um, topics like how sexuality is constructed, how women's sexuality is constructed around masochism, the politics of women's mental health. The, the feminism of the present is very much about the politics of the public world, which is hugely important with issues such as the reign of terror and the, the, all of the different varieties of that terror, but not how that terror creates the whole psychology of women and creates women's behavior. That's not really being discussed. Femininity, the high heels is separated from the kidnap on the street. And I think we need to see those things together. So another question is, if what do you think? Do you think if it was published <clears throat> in Mexico now, and maybe it will be since these books are being published in other languages, it would be well received? And if not, why not? And uh, who do you think would like it? Uh, I... Of course, I, I think it should be published, but I really don't see it happening. Uh, not only because of the ideological climate, 
uh, you have just said your your own publisher is asking you to change a fundamental part of your book how, how dare they <laughs> imagine telling telling d graham no but you can you can speak about terror so 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 let's 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 throw the whole thing away well um well not only because of this but because of the state of the publishing industry a university press would consider it old despite its relevance not to mention their transgenderist capture the transgenderist capture of universities uh, whereas a commercial publisher would consider it too academic and they would expect thousands they would they would uh, require thousands of copies to be sold which would be very unlikely <laughs> uh, so so it would need a brave and committed independent publisher and this would be only a radical feminist press and in mexico we don't have one and, and let me say uh, I, I found out it it was already translated into portuguese in brazil it, it is titled amar para sobreviver mulheres de síndrome de estocolmo social and and in and in korean uh, no wonder yeah. why in, in korean I, I i understand it perfectly because of the 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 strength of the feminist radical feminist movement in Korean right now. Um, so, so I don't think I haven't tried it. I have talked about this book with some publishers, but they don't. They don't. They don't make any. They they they, they don't listen to 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 me. Or they, they don't want to know about it. So it's sad. Yes. I think maybe not in Spanish, but we do now have a feminist, but, but we've had Labris in Spain. And they yes, are yes, 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 not in Mexico. Labris no. is the one who, who, yes. who could publish it, if any. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, in, uh, can I just say something about the Stockholm Syndrome analysis? Because somebody's been, um, Bodil has been talking about it in the chat. Um, Swedish friends have explained that um, the, the way that Stockholm Syndrome is normally understood and the way that it's described at the beginning of this book is not necessarily accurate because in fact, the, the bonding that happened was out of fear rather than out of um, you know, a, a real kind of bonding. And also one of the men who was involved, who was a man that the, the, the main um, aggressor made a demand that a man be released from prison, who was a nasty man, but was not as bad as the original hostage taker. And the women tried to get on side with him because he was less likely to kill them and indeed didn't show any desire to kill them. So there were different dynamics going on that have not been fully covered. I mean, I think what an interesting case to look at as well would be um, the abduction of Patty Hurst, which some of you looking at this will understand. In 1974, the daughter <coughs> of the very um, huge and significant publisher, uh, William Hurst, was kidnapped by a group called the Symbionese Liberation Army. And after a while of being kid, uh, kidnapped and involved with them, she actually took part in some of the anarchist activities that she um, that the group was involved in. Um, and so I, I, and she actually got prosecuted for that and so on. So that's quite an interesting case, um, which obviously isn't mentioned in this book, but it's a case where a, a woman kidnapped and abducted apparently allies herself with the captors. But I think the thing is about the uh, Stockholm syndrome, um, she uses stock, societal Stockholm syndrome and uses those words and relates to Stockholm itself, but I don't think we need to uh, precisely base it on what happened in Stockholm. I find it easier to think of what happens to women where femininity comes from, heterosexually, love of men, servicing of men and so on. I find it easier to see that as the behavior of prisoners or slaves in a general sense, rather than simply in hostage taking situations. I do remember though, that we had training when I was um, working at University of Melbourne and uh, we were told 
what to do in a hostage situation because it could happen. And we were told that it was important to try and get along with the captor, to try and uh, instigate the human side of the captor by making some kind of link with them. We had um, interesting hostage training going on. And of course, they're, one of the things that's recommended for women in prostitution is that they should do hostage training so that when they're alone with a man and so on, they will be able to survive. So these behaviors of ordinary hostage taking are, of course, the ordinary behaviors of femininity, all of the ways in which men um, women are desperately trying to keep men on side, smiling, using the whole of their face. I find that fascinating, particularly American women. When I go to hear them speak and so on, their faces are incredibly mobile. Every single thing they say to a mixed audience, their faces are just moving all over the place because, of course, men's faces are still. Not only do they not smile, their faces are still. But when American women in particular speak, every facial muscle is on the go. It's like a nervous tick sometimes. I'm talking about women who follow the dictates of femininity, some of them senior academics as well. I'm not talking about lesbian feminists, radical feminists and so on. So it's fascinating. I think watching the faces to see how many of the facial muscles are in play during ordinary interactions is a good way of understanding how women behave in the behavior of subordinates, how they need to please. It's, it's the need to please. Um, now, I, I, I'm not sure, is there anything else you need to say or should we just think, are there any questions that women would like to have answered? What do you think, Laura? Did you see anything in the chat? Or? I haven't seen the, the chat, sorry, because uh, uh, I prefer to pay attention <laughs> yes. to what you are saying. <laughs> But but there, there's something there's something here. another another quote from Graham which I would like to read is the reader is encouraged to approach the topic with with this skepticism and open mind of an objective researcher the life experiences of each reader will provide tests of this theory rather than accepting or rejecting the theory outright the reader is encouraged to test for herself the utility of societal Stockholm syndrome in making sense of her own and others' behavior on the basis of societal Stockholm syndrome and to see whether those predictions are borne out. If the theory is valid, they will be. So, of course, she's no, she's no dogmatist. She, she's, she's, um, she, she approaches the subject with a scientific mind, with a researcher mind, and she's open to criticism, of course. Uh, but I, I think it's a pity that the fact that the book is not as well known as, as it should be. So there are so many researchers which could have been made uh, uh, with this starting point of view, with, with, with this in mind, so many ways which could, could have been, uh, the theory would ha could have been put to test and, and it hasn't happened. And um, so as I, as I told you before, I, uh, there are plenty of situations which, which I only understand having this in mind, having this in mind. Uh, as uh, the, this, this urge to please, which is a fundamental part of femininity, why is it? Why do we prefer to, to adopt the point of view of males, even feminists adopting on feminist point of views? I think it is because they want to please them. They are terrified of losing their support. They are terrified of thinking of them as, as man haters. And everything falls into place, as I told you. It would be great if somebody, uh, after listening to us, goes and buys the book and reads it, a researcher, I mean, and, 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 and goes on to put it to test. It would be amazing. Uh, that would be the best, the best, um, uh, how do you say, uh, homage oh, to, to the gram. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks, Laura. I just noticed in the chat, um, Caroline Norma from 
Melbourne, who once did a PhD with me, which was absolutely terrific, and is now um, uh, quite a senior academic in, on, in her own right. And she's saying that she's got a PhD student who's interviewing women about their experiences of husbands using pornography. And she's been inundated with interviewees, far too many for even a PhD project. But there's hardly any research on this topic because it's a private one. Everyone res uh, researches revenge pornography, but not these privatized harms. And I think that's very interesting because it makes me think, what is the terror of a woman who has the man using this pornography in her own home? And she has to live with it and know that he's doing it, knows that what he's doing up on the, um, in the room upstairs or whatever. That's definitely a woman being subjected to reign of terror within her home and must be extremely frightening. So we, we don't really pay attention to these aspects of um, the psychology of women. Now, um, is there anything else that women are wanting to say? I'm sure there are questions that I didn't get to. I should say, because somebody asked that I am doing a new book, and indeed I did mention this, the new book will be out sometime next year when the editors have decided that I have explained Reign of Terror sufficiently that they are prepared to allow it to be published. Oh, and somebody also here is asking about children in homes. Well, one of the things that I write about in penile imperialism is the fact that sadomasochists who live their practice in their home, they have dungeons, they do all the stuff, um, are, are worried that they're not able to get custody of children easily enough. And I question in the book whether it should be easy for them to get custody of children because children will be then raised in sadomasochism, which is very much the reign of terror. Obviously, the children are raised in a reign of terror if the men are violent towards the, their mothers anyway. But sadomasochism is another one of the threats that we have to uh, face. So I think that's probably, that's probably where we are. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to have been able to talk about this. Any, any final thoughts, Laura? Uh, not really. I think we covered the most important aspects of it. Uh, I really wish some women get to read this book now. And, and, um, uh, and uh, another example uh, of something which is happening right now and maybe 30 years ago wasn't as pervasive as it is now, uh, BDSM can also be, be studied in the light of, uh, of societal Stockholm syndrome. Uh, Oh, the, well, and many, many things, but, but this is one which we are seeing now uh, uh, and it is terrorizing indeed. <laughs> Uh, well yes absolutely yes well it's been it's been a very fascinating chat and thanks for everybody being here and joining and i'm sorry if i didn't get round to really important questions but really i mean this is only the beginning isn't it we're back in a new wonderful wave of feminism where these questions are being asked where we're going to be talking about all of it and we are getting going i think that's that's all I have to say, really. So thanks very, very much, Laura. And Thank I you. think at my pleasure, my absolute pleasure. And I think we will now um, end. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>